So the typeface is called Frost Condensed Sans. And, you know, initially, we were, like, looking for different typefaces that might go well with the Frost brand. However, we didn't really find anything that fully captured the, the creative spirit, um, fearless creativity of Frost. So we thought, well, you know, why not just make our own typeface then? Welcome to Fractional by Swarm. This is the podcast where we interview top fractional designers, engineers, makers, and builders. See how the best fractional workers carve their own path, complete their side quests, and passions in life. This is your gateway to living a successful fractional lifestyle. In this episode of Fractional, we talk to Frances Thaw. She's an independent designer who specializes in creating bespoke websites, digital products, and interactive stories on Webflow. Since the start of Frances's independent design practice, her work has been recognized by awards, CSS Design Awards, Type Wolf, and Buried Signals. We talk about Frost Condensed Sands, a typeface Francis made for Frost Design, the benefits of being a multidisciplinary designer, learning the language and domain expertise of your clients, the power of introspection, and why scratching your itch matters for your fractional career. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Francis. Welcome back to the studio. Welcome to Fractional. Hey Alexis, thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, so Francis, can you please introduce yourself to all of our listeners? Sure. So I am Francis, and I currently do bespoke websites and interactive stories. What's what's a bespoke website? So bespoke websites just means that you're getting good typography, branding, illustrations, animations, like basically the whole package. It's not like you're just usual get a template from a marketplace kind of thing. Yes, no. So when you look at the the websites I make, they're actually different from what you typically see online. They're more customized for your brand, for your unique context. More customized. So can you give an example of that? So for example, in my past project with Angela for DigiValley, the the founders of DigiValley wanted a website that was more cutting edge with more complex animations, uh, better visuals and all. So we knew that we could not just grab a template online, change the text, mm. change the color, launch it, and we're done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you had to do your own Desi curves, um, all of the interactions. Mm. And I know you, because we go a long way back, I think you're right into the details. Like, Every class name should be perfect. <laughs> All the interactions need to be organized. Um, what kind of tools do you use to make it happen? I use just two tools, actually. Figma and Webflow. Oh, you, you love Webflow, I think. Yes. Right? Like, why do you love it? It lets me build websites without the need to write code. I can just drag stuff around, and after a few days' time or a few weeks' time a website can be built. Wait, but that's like a kind of like setting unrealistic expectations, especially for like uh, most beginners, right? Because like, although Webflow is a visual programming tool, mm -hmm. it's a no-code tool, mm -hmm. it still requires a certain amount of skill mm -hmm. in HTML and CSS. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that? Yes, I do agree that although Webflow is a no-code tool, having baseline knowledge in CSS... HTML would be super helpful because that way you know how to structure um, the the design properly. You're not just dragging some random stuff and hoping that it just turns out well. Okay, cool. So Francis, you are one of the talented designers I know in the you know in the local scene in the Philippines, and you've been a product designer. You co-founded a startup. Why go? like a fractional designer uh, <laughs> life right now. Mm -hmm. Sure. So last year, I just wanted to uh, do my own thing. Actually, for the longest time, I have been thinking about that. But initially, I thought, oh, maybe I should just get some experience working for an actual company first. But then as the, the day is passed by, I just had this nagging feeling of just, you know, doing it right now while I'm still young. So I was like, well, you know, just do it then. 
And so here I am. What are your considerations when you when you when you made a decision? Mm-hmm. I wanted freedom and control. Freedom and control. Yes. So the good thing about being um, a fractional designer is the fact that you can pick your own projects. So by picking your own projects, you get to work on things which actually uh, interest you. What are the things that interest you? And like, what, what <laughs> kind of projects are those? So right now, I'm working with Frost Design and Consulting Group. So, oh, JP and yes, friends. Yes, JP. Okay. Shout out shout to out, JP. Shout out to JP. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I saw you post like a series of uh, things on social media that you made a typeface like yes. for, for their anniversary or something. Right? Yes. So the typeface is called Frost Condensed Sands. And, you know, initially, we were like looking for different typefaces that might go well with the Frost brand. However, we didn't really find anything that fully captured the the creative spirit, um, fearless creativity of Frost. So we thought, well, you know, why not just make our own typeface then? And I think for someone like you, we came from the same school. Um, as far as I know, in your program, Information Design in Ateneo, you did the typography course. Was that any of help for you when you, when you were doing the typeface itself? Mm-hmm. It, it was somewhat helpful, yes, because that typography course gave me the baseline knowledge on how typography works, right? How do you know if a font or typeface is serif, sans serif, if it's humanist or transitional? Um, how do you look at the different parts of a glyph, mm. right? So, but can a self-taught designer like learn all of that and make their own typeface? What do you think? I think it's possible. Like, there are so many books out there, resources, YouTube videos that you can just watch. And That's control. is that what you did? Like when when you were doing the typeface itself? Um, to be honest, I didn't really do some pre-reading before. I just. Mm. Jumped into okay, it. Okay, okay. Made the typeface. That's great. Piece. That's great to hear. Because <laughs> that means you don't really need like a super formal education to do it, right? I think having some knowledge is still helpful. Okay. Like, some level of baseline yeah, knowledge. Yeah, some level to, of baseline knowledge. To do it right. Yes. Okay. So walk us through, you know, just how you made it and what, what was okay. the impact so far. So, you know, a lot of people thought that I used some complex... Uh, type software for that. But to be honest, I just used Figma because it's a tool that I was most familiar with. So I just used Figma. I just drew a bunch of rectangles and circles. I merged them together, flattened them, and then that was it, honestly. Was there some sort of plugin that you used to turn into a type? No. So how do you do it? Like, you export to an OTF or something? No, we, we haven't um done that yet mm. so whatever um letters or words you're seeing right now like they were arranged manually, manually. okay okay that's cool i think at some point you will you will probably turn it into a proper format but um i think it's incredible there are not a lot of uh, type designers here maybe um some of the people from some studios, like, you know, Plus 63. Mm-hmm. Um, so, what have you been learning recently, Francis? What have I been learning recently? Yeah. It's more on, I would say, type design. Mm. So, uh, JP has been helpful in giving me feedback on the small details of my typeface. Just yesterday, we were fixing some details that people would not really notice, but can actually make a huge difference um, in the typeface. So for example, for uh, the letter E, we had to like make some of the bars longer and mm. than the rest. And then, you know, like if you look at it, you wouldn't really like know that okay, this bar is like longer than the no other. No one cares. Basically. No one really cares, <laughs> but it makes the vibe, the aura of the typeface just changes mm. when you adjust that small things. Even if they're, you know, just by a few pixels. Mm. Like, I had to like move the the bar like just like three pixels or four pixels. Yeah. And then it yeah, made it all 
better. One of the most important things to, you know, top tier designers, and this is something we believe at Swarm, like it's it's something that we need employees to care about is like some level of obsession over the craft, right? Like craft quality mm-hmm. needs to be top notch. What do you think enabled you to have this kind of mm-hmm. mindset? I think being a holistic designer helped. So before I was a web designer, I did many things. I was an illustrator. I did some fine art. I did um, graphic design, some photography. I learned how to write a bit. So I guess all those different skills kind of um, like mixed together mm. and it's like cross pollinate. Yeah, cross pollinate uh, whole experience and like when you try to apply it, it it, it it's it has a better output or an outcome. Yes. Right. So, talk about the value of you know just being a multidisciplinary mm-hmm. designer. What so, does that even mean? I'll share one story. There was a time actually last week, um, JP made me review a website that they did for a client, and then as I uh, checked the website, I saw that there was one image, one asset, which looked okay, but then some adjustment had to be made to make it even more better. So I told JP, um, I saw that certain images kind of clash together at one point. In illustration, that's called a tangent. And that just... A tangent. What is that? It's when different points inter... Lines intersect at one okay. point. Okay. Um, and it just gives the the drawing like a weird feeling. Like, okay. why is everything like just squished in one mm. area so you I can like th- you can kind of take a look at a website more holistically um evaluate each element properly because you know the principles behind so many fields mm-hmm. okay about being a multidisciplinary designer i think you had a recent client where mm-hmm. you're able to apply that you know mm-hmm. just experience right can mm-hmm. you talk a little bit more about that sure so i had a project recently where I worked with architects. So it was a website for one of their businesses. And when the project started, I already had some knowledge of architecture. Like I knew people like Zaha Hadid, um, Ando Manosa, um, IP Santos, different architects. And since I had that knowledge already, I could easily converse with them and get closer to them. So that made um, the project much easier because then I understood their language in a way. Understanding your client's um, domain expertise, mm. their their language in their domain is super helpful Like as an independent um, designer, right? Do you have any tips for people who are just starting out and like wanting to be more you know, multi-dimensional. <laughs> <laughs> it really helps to never stop learning. Um, you know, all the skills that I attained over the past few years were because I was just really, really curious about certain things. And whenever I had that curiosity, I just wanted to scratch that itch. So okay. I just had to like, like if I am curious about Zaha Hadid's architecture, I would just like Google her, read her Wikipedia article. Mm. And by just doing that, I now have some knowledge on what her work's like Mm -hmm. and how she approaches things. So these things may be be small, but then they just compound over time. And as you meet different people, say architects, um, HR managers, just about anybody, you can better converse with them. Yeah. In my case, I think since I worked at Caliber before, right, I had an intimate knowledge of like the interview process, pe- people being job seekers, employers being employers, <laughs> and what their behavior is like, and what their domain expertise was like, and how they were thinking. I think um, it all boils down to still being customer centric or like just empathizing. And knowing who you're talking to, mm. um, I think it's the same, right? Like, would you feel like it's the same for when you were contracting for different types of clients or like different studios? Definitely. I really think it helps to know stuff about your client. Like, don't just 
talk to them when the meeting's there. Try Googling them. See what they like, what they're into. So stalk them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's right. Like that. Yeah. Yes. So I do that too. Like when, let's say, um, before in, in my other podcast, right? Like when I'm researching guests, I kind of try to uh, get into their head. Okay, why did this person go here? Mm-hmm. Why did this person do this specific thing? Or how do they converse online? Just so I could understand their you know, profile as a person. And that helps me have a better conversation um, during the interview. So yeah, I, th- I think that's great. So for you, Frances, um, what's your advice for people who want to be better at just scratching their itch, you know? Like, I don't think it's the unbridled curiosity, mm-hmm. that that trait. It's not something everyone has. Mm-hmm. So what are your tips in cultivating that? I guess it's just following your heart. Following your heart. If you encounter something that you are interested in, don't try to deny that feeling explore it further ask yourself like why do i like this is it because of the way you can um like dabble with the details is it because you like um how systems are are made or engineered so i guess it's just more introspection Mm, mm. and would you say that you are you know self-aware i would say so yes you know designer are there any ways to be more introspective or self-aware of yourself? Because, like, this is a real problem, mm-hmm. right? So, like, pe- people don't really know how good they are or, like, mm-hmm. um, they don't have the tenacity, let's say, to follow that heart mm-hmm. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. well, like, what are your thoughts on that? Mm-hmm. You know, to be honest, I think it's because I grew up introspective already. Mm. So that was there. But, you know, growing up, I spent a lot of time alone doing hobbies by myself. Mm. So I guess I had a lot of time to, like, self-reflect. I think for people out there who may not have a natural grasp of it, it might be helpful to maybe journal a bit Mm. or maybe a lot, 30 minutes doing nothing and just, like, thinking about what you did for the day, how that made you feel. So I think that's a good starting point. That's extremely important um, to me when I have these moments that I feel very energetic or like I feel like my brain has so much in it. I try to stop and just write it down. Like I think writing is a just a great way to expand your knowledge itself because like it's like knowing yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, you need to put it on paper or exactly. like whatever. No, it's, no, it's app. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, you did blogs before, right? Like, maybe let's talk about that. Like, mm-hmm. um, why have you been writing before? The blog. Yeah, right? yeah. So, for the blog, I just noticed that lots of people uh, back then wanted to learn illustration. But then there weren't a lot of resources available. So I thought, well, you know, since I know how to illustrate, may as well just write my my knowledge and experiences in a blog and then share it with the world. What do you think are the advantages of, like, just writing, or, you know, or just sharing mm-hmm. it into the world? I think, one, it just is a test um, of your expertise in mm. the area. When you write about something, you really have to know what you're writing about. And if you have any gaps in your knowledge, you can still research more mm. to fill in that gap. Yes. And in a way that deepens your your understanding of mm. something. Again, I guess for other people, with other people read your writing, at least now like they know what your ex- what your experience was like. Yeah. It's a feedback loop as well. Mm-hmm. Like if people read your writing, you get feedback and you identify your gaps. It's like what you said, it's one more way to expand that mm-hmm. or deepen that knowledge even further. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes I think about it in a certain way. It's like you need to write about it 
you need to talk about it, mm-hmm. you need to do it, you need to generate proof or projects mm-hmm. um, to cultivate any kind of skill um, or gain domain expertise over something um, and just, you know, find people you can teach it to, mm-hmm. right? Um, do, you, you, do you believe that's true? Yes. Cool. Um, so, Francis, I think that's it. I just mm-hmm. want to have... I just have one last question for you. What's your advice to all the fractional workers listening to you right now? Never stop learning. Scratch that itch of curiosity and then follow it all the way through. Okay, you heard it here. Scratch yourselves. (laughs) (laughs) Um, No, scratch your itch. Find um, your obsessions. Follow your curiosity and it will lead you the way. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Francis, for being on Fractional. It was nice having you here. Thank you, Alexis.